Father, we look upon you today in your sanctuary to behold your power and glory. So open our eyes that we may see the beauty and the wonder of who you are through your word. We declare that your steadfast love is better than life. And so our lips will praise you. Our hearts will sing of your fame. And we declare with the psalmist today that we will bless you as long as we live. And God, let that be a reality that as long as we live, we will faithfully, persistently bless your holy name. And in your name today, we lift up holy hands in surrender, in worship, for you are worthy. And God, we pray for our Muslim neighbors, that as they enter into a time of prayer and fasting and spiritual seeking, we do pray for greater revelations of truth, greater revelations and dreams of Jesus in their lives, that these neighbors would become true family members of the faith one day. And we also pray, God, for our team in Brazil, our brothers and sisters on this mission trip, that you would protect them and as they go forth in the poorest and one of the largest red light districts in Brazil, would the spirit of the living God fall powerfully upon this team so that even as they look upon these children, these children would sense the love of God for them. And Lord, we pray for freedom in Brazil. Even as the World Cup continues, Lord, we desire justice for these precious children and these women and even the men, the customers, that they would experience freedom in Christ. So Lord, we give you this team and ask that you would use them greatly for your glory. And for all the families who are in the process of adoption, with the delays that have been happening, with the laws that are seemingly challenging their desires, we pray for open doors for these children, every orphan in this nation, to find a forever family one day soon. God, I ask now that this time would be holy, sacred time before you. So fill me with your spirit, anoint me, and Holy Spirit, I ask that you would preach through me so that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock, our redeemer, and it is in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You know, when I was growing up, uh, I always dreamed of being a professional athlete. I think a lot of uh, children have that dream when they grow up, watching their favorite sports and the Olympics. Uh, you know, for me, uh, because I was a big Cowboys fan, I would dream of being the next quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. Thank you for not laughing. And um, also, I was a big uh, Chicago Cubs fan, and so I would dream of being the next Ryan Sandberg. And, of course, every person who loved basketball on this planet dreams of being able to be the next Michael Jordan. But you know, as I got older, uh, my dream slowly uh, was getting shattered when the draft would happen, when the new teams would pick their new players, and suddenly in the draft were people my age. And I was like, what? That can't be, right? Because I'm not ready yet. They didn't call me. And uh, it hit me that I was not going to become a professional athlete, and then I realized that the dream is over. Uh, and then I started to think, you know, maybe I could become a chaplain for these sports teams, you know, and uh, that was another possibility. And the reason why I was thinking about this, about shattered dreams of what my life might have been like in the future, is because I had an interesting conversation with a pastor last week. Uh, the English ministry pastors, we have a monthly prayer meeting where we worship and share and 
pray for each other the last Thursday of each month. And it's a really great time for us to really connect and just love each other in this way. And at the end of our worship session, we usually break up into small groups and just share and pray for each other. And one of the pastors uh, in my small group, I've known uh, throughout the duration of my time in Korea, and he is just a, a wonderful servant of the Lord. He's been faithful to his church through a lot of challenging circumstances. He was a faithful shepherd. And we were sharing, and he was sharing how he's turning 40 this year. And uh, he was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm turning 40 uh, because I had so many dreams of what my life would have been like by the time I became 40 years old. He was like, you know, I always, because he started ministry when he was young, he's like, I always dreamed that I would become the next Rick Warren or the next Bill Hybels or even the next Billy Graham by the time I was 40, that I would be influencing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people uh, with the gospel. And I'm turning 40 this year, and I realize my dream is over. And he was really wrestling with this, and I was really surprised uh, because his idea of successful ministry or effective ministry is what I guess a lot of us usually think of when we think about ministry. It has to do with numbers, that if you're part of a big ministry, you must be effective or successful. And he wasn't, and so he was really getting down on himself, kind of going through like a midlife crisis in front of me. You know, he's like, no, I really thought by this age I would have done more to be effective for the kingdom of God. And uh, it really saddened me because as I thought about his life in the years that I've known him, he has been a faithful servant. He has been so diligent, and he's gone through some tough times because of critics and various other challenges. And I realized, man, um, in my eyes and in the ways that I really think that God would see him, I, I would see him as a wonderful, successful minister. And uh, it got me thinking after the worship service about really what does it mean to be a successful believer or a minister? What does it mean to be uh, a success in the eyes of God more than the eyes of the world. Because we all want to be effective. We all want our pastors and spiritual leaders to be effective. But what does that really mean? Is it just about numbers? Is it just about popularity? Uh, and we want to explore this concept today. Uh, and it leads us into our next prayer topic for our pastors. We're in a series on how to pray for your pastor. And we've gone over the necessity for intercessory prayer for our pastors, the need to pray for protection, that they are on the front lines of so much warfare for your souls and for the souls of others, for your growth and for the growth of others. So they face a lot of opposition, so we have to pray for their protection. Uh, there are so many demands that pull pastors in so many different directions, so we need to really pray for rest, that they would be restored in the Lord. Uh, we want to pray for anointing, that there would be a, as we talked about, anointing means a smothering, a smearing of the Spirit and His presence in a powerful way over the lives and ministries of our spiritual leaders. And last week we looked at the importance of praying for a yielded heart, that we would always have a sensitive and obedient heart, that we would obey the Lord quickly and completely when God calls us to do something. And uh, this series is a reflection of Paul's heart's for prayer from his churches. He often will pray or ask for prayer for the churches that he started and that he ministered to. And I think the heartbeat is also found in Romans 15.30 when he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. So he's asking them to strive with me in prayer. When you pray, strive with me. And we looked at what that means is, he's saying, wrestle with me and wrestle for me. Fight with me and fight for me as I fight for you in the place of prayer. That ultimately is what intercessory prayer is. We learn to fight for each other as we pray for each other. And today, the next prayer topic that I want to look at is the importance of praying for effectiveness in ministry. So everyone repeat, effectiveness in ministry. All right, so we want to pray for effectiveness in ministry as we do pray for our spiritual leaders. So turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 9 to 14, 
as we look at this prayer and these requests for prayer uh, from the heart of Paul. Follow along with me in your outlines as well today. So what does it mean to pray for effectiveness in ministry? A few things that I want to highlight. First of all, it means we pray for wisdom. So everyone repeat, pray for wisdom. So in order to be effective in ministry, one of the most important things we need is wisdom from God. Let's look at first our Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So in this pastoral prayer of Paul, we see he prays for the church in Colossae to be filled with the knowledge of his will, and he prays that they will be filled with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. If you are taking notes in your outline, I want, you, I want you to underline the words all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's the key part I want to focus on for this first point of my sermon. That he is praying for all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now what is wisdom? Wisdom gives us the ability to walk in the ways that are pleasing to the Lord. It is about making choices that bring great honor to God and the greatest good for God's people. It is something that we must pray for because it is something that we need to continually be growing in. It is not something that you get one day and you have it fully for the rest of your life. Because Luke chapter 2 even tells us how Jesus himself, when he was on this earth, he would be growing in wisdom and in favor before God and men. So it is something that we too need to be growing in as we seek the Lord. And probably the most famous uh, example of a spiritual leader asking God for wisdom is found in Solomon's example when God would ask him of, to respond to, a, to an amazing offer. Now Solomon, as you know, was King David's son, and he succeeded his father as king over Israel, and suddenly he was given an offer of a lifetime. It was basically like an open, uh, blank check lottery ticket. It's, uh, so basically, God says this to Solomon, Solomon, you're king now, I love you, you're following in the footsteps of David, who is a man after my own heart, and I want to give you a gift, so ask me for anything, and I'll give it to you. Uh, so it's like a dream come true, right? If God says to you, ask me for anything, and I'll give it to you. Right? It's kind of like uh, when I was in elementary school, we have these uh, scenarios that we play with our friends off, often, right? If you uh, had a genie come up to you and say, I'll give you one wish, what would you wish for? You know, we all ask for, I wish for three more wishes, right? Um, no, but honestly, what would you ask for? If you could be guaranteed anything that you ask for from God, what would it be? One thing, what would you ask for? In our day, it would probably be what? A uh, million dollars, a billion dollars, uh, a relationship, a spouse, children, singleness, marriage, right? <laughs> Depending on who you ask, right? Solomon gets the question that we would all dream of getting. One guaranteed answer to anything we could ask for. And what does he ask for? Let's see it in 1 Kings chapter 3. I'll read from verse 7. It says, And now this is his response. O Lord my God, you have made me your servant king in place of David my father, although, although I am but a little child. I, do not how to go, I don't know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitudes. And so look at verse 9. This is what he asked for. So God says, I'll give you anything. You name it, I'll give it to you. And this is what he asked for in verse 9. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind, wisdom, to govern your people, to lead your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this great, your great people? 
So Solomon can have anything from God. What does he ask for? He says, for wisdom. God, I need discernment. He says, God, you've given me such an important role to play in the lives of your precious people. I don't know much. I'm a young leader. I've never been king before. Your people are so important. So God, I need wisdom and understanding to know how to lead, how to guide, how to serve so that the choices that I make will impact them in a blessed way. Amazing humility, amazing requests, amazing selflessness that we see displayed in the hearts of Solomon. You see, he understands one thing about leadership, and that is the decisions that a top leader makes affects everybody else under their leadership. Uh, we have to only look at the ferry disaster that happened in this country uh, less than two months ago to know that the command of the captain of the ship for everybody to stay placed in their rooms, it affected everybody's life detrimentally. In North Korea, the decisions that Kim Jong-un makes, it impacts the whole country. It impacts their freedom, their ability to work, their ability to worship. And just last re week, it was reported that he had the first public execution for about 80 people throughout the country for crimes such as possession of Bibles. See, the decision of a leader impacts everyone under that leadership. We're also seeing the impact of a leader's decision in the U.S. now to change attitudes and policies concerning gay marriages. It's a hot issue now, impacting the workplace and even impacting church denominations. In fact, within the past two weeks, four major church denominations in the United States have changed the definition of marriage to accommodate uh, what is happening widespread throughout the world in this generation. And in Korea, too, in the workplace, if a boss says, everybody stays in the office until I leave home, and he decides to stay until 11 p.m., that impacts everybody's life and lifestyle. Right? So the leadership decisions that are made by top leaders, it affects our lives, be it for good or for ill. Therefore, we need to pray for wisdom for our leaders so that we will all be blessed by the choices that they make. Amen? We will be impacted by them. And so we need to pray for our leadership that they will make good, wise, godly choices so that blessings will flow down instead of foolishness. And especially for the church where lives and souls are at stake, we need to pray that our pastors and spiritual leaders would make good and godly choices that will impact eternity and expand the kingdom of God. You see, it is not easy to figure out what is the best path of discipleship for a church. There are so many methods, so many ideas, so many opinions, and it is not easy to figure out the best way uh, to lead OEM, right? This is a unique ministry where we have so many people from so many different backgrounds, and this is such a transient ministry. People come and go. We train them, disciple them, they leave, and then new people come. We have to find who are the people who want to serve, and it's such a difficult challenge to lead such a unique ministry. What is the best way to do membership? What's the best way to do missions, discipleship? So it's hard sometimes to figure things out. So we need wisdom from God to make the best choices possible to help this church grow in maturity. So please pray for us to have wisdom from God to lead and to shepherd this church. Amen? Uh, and even in our pursuit of justice for Korea, we need so much wisdom. Uh, this is such a unique area of ministry that has not been... Uh, published well in, within these past decades? How does a church engage in so many of these justice causes? How, what does it look like to fight for the orphan in this unique culture? What does it look like to fight for the enslaved in our unique context? Uh, what is the best way to partner with the Korean side as they recently started a justice ministry? Right? And they are asking us for advice in the best steps to take. We need wisdom uh, from God to answer those questions. And even what is the best way to handle the relationship that we've been given with pimps, traffickers, and even the head pimp overall Korea? Right? How, how do we navigate this relationship with this man? Um, how often do we meet with him? How, 
Uh, often do we do our red light district outreaches? And when we do meet with him, how much do we really share about our faith background? How much do we share about what we really want to see happen through our outreach endeavors? We need wisdom to guide us. And we also need to remember where real wisdom begins. Proverbs 9 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We begin to make wise choices when we fear and revere the Lord. And when that filters our thought process, we will begin to make better choices. If the motive is to honor God, if the motive is because we fear and respect the Lord and we love him, that will help us make wise choices. You see, foolish choices are made when we lose our fear of God and we lose our fear of sin. So pray for wisdom and understanding so that our choices and our ministries will be effective in honoring God in all things. Amen? So that's an important prayer to pray for your pastors. Uh, pray for much wisdom from God. Pray for much fear of God to govern their life and their choices. But there's another thing we must pray for when praying for effectiveness in ministry, and that is we need to learn to pray for fruitfulness. So everyone repeat, pray for fruitfulness. So pray that our ministry would be fruitful to the glory of God's name. 2 Thessalonians 3.1 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, pray for us. And what does he ask for? That the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. So Paul is saying, pray for us that the word of the Lord, our preaching ministry, our teaching ministry, our evangelism and our missions ministries, that when we share the word of the Lord, it would spread ahead, that it would speed ahead, that it would spread rapidly, and as it spreads to people's ears, it would be honored in people's hearts, just as you receive the word and honor the Lord's word within your own life. This is a prayer for effectiveness in ministry. So for every Sunday that we gather together, I want to ask you for prayers, for effectiveness, that when people hear the word, that people will get saved. That when people hear the word, that those who are saved would grow more mature in their faith, that they would love Jesus more. From our children's ministry, to the youth ministry, to our adult ministries, and even our Wednesday night of prayers, that every time that the word of God is delivered in our ministry, in our small groups, that all who hear the word would honor the word and honor the God of the word. Amen? That is how to pray for fruitfulness within ministries. So we want to pray that would reap a harvest and save and sanctify his people. You know, I was extremely blessed to be a part of a good work of fruitfulness during my time when I was in Sydney, Australia. I first went there uh, with the intention, uh, like many of you when you come to Korea, I first went there with the intention of just staying for a year. Right? And you know how that goes, right? Seven years later. Um, uh, and so what happened is I was pastoring in Korea prior, and I plan on moving back to the United States. But... Uh, a church that I would guest speak at in Sydney every once in a while heard that I was leaving Korea, and they asked me, hey, uh, before you decide to go back to the U.S., how about coming to Australia? Uh, because there are so many Korean churches in America, they have English ministries, but in Australia, also an English-speaking country, none of the Korean churches there had any English ministries. And so the pastor uh, got his foot in the door in my heart, and he said, why don't you just come here for a year? I'm all only asking for a year, <laughs> and uh, help us start up this ministry. Uh, you could find somebody to take your spot, and then you could go back to the U.S. And so, you know, we prayed about it, and we're like, okay, let's uh, strategically invest a year into an area that did not have an English ministry, a country, in fact, where all the Kr Korean churches didn't have an English ministry for the next generation. And so we went, and um, we started, you know, we were able to gather about eight people, and uh, of those eight people uh, was myself. Uh, my wife did the PowerPoint, you know, the overhead display, and my cousin was the piano player. So three out of eight were, you know, my family members, you know. Uh, but it's okay. We uh, were like, all right, let's... So in my mind, I'm thinking, all right, so just a year. I'm just for a year, for a year. Okay, so it's okay. Um, and then we just started to teach and preach the gospel. 
And for the reaction that I kept getting from people is that it's the first time that they fully understood the gospel because it was not in Korean. And they were so glad to finally hear the gospel in their heart language, in their first language. And so people slowly started getting saved. And in fact, because the other Korean churches started to hear that we had an English-speaking pastor, they would ask me to speak, and every time I would speak, I would share the basic gospel. Uh, and then people would respond, and then other churches started having uh, joint retreats and joint conferences and asked me, can you share it to these groups? And slowly, there would be hundreds of people gathered together, I'd just share the gospel, um, and then like 90% of the people would give their lives to Christ. Because, again, it's the first time that they're fully understanding the gospel. And I was amazed. I was like, oh my goodness, this is beautiful. As I was seeing hearts fall in love with God because they understood the gospel in their heart language. Uh, I can honestly say it's not because of me. I made myself available. But they were hungry and ready because they were longing to understand the gospel. And um, it started happening in Sydney and then Melbourne and Perth and all these other cities. And we realized that we couldn't just leave after the first year. We had to disciple. And so within a couple of years, our ministry grew from about eight people to about 250 people. And so uh, that original one-year plan turned into almost seven years, uh, like many of you in Korea. Um, and what I found out throughout those years was after talking to parents and teachers who were teachers of those children for many years, that I happened to step into a place that was covered in prayer for over a decade, praying for fruitfulness for a harvest for the next generation. And so the f harvest that I was seeing, the fruitfulness that I was seeing, was really a byproduct of years and years of prayer from parents and pastors and teachers who invested and sowed into the next generation through their intercessory prayers. You see, most often when we see fruits, it is because there were people praying for years in the secret place that we may never have known about until glory. And that's also what happened in nations that seemed closed. Many years ago, uh, the former uh, U the Soviet Republic uh, the USSR, basically, one of the things, when that communist regime was so strong, um, there were churches throughout the world that would send in prayer teams in that strong communist bloc, and they would do prayer walks throughout the nations of that area. And then when the walls of communists broke and suddenly people were able to worship freely, the rest of the world saw it as such a surprise. No one would have dreamed that that strong power uh, would have fell in that way so quickly. But those who were praying for this for decades, they saw this as a final answer to prayers. And you need to also understand that there have been people going inside our neighboring nation to the north of us for years in a similar way. Prayer teams, prayer walking throughout the different places, praying with their eyes open, ju just as we do in our fire by nights, to sow prayers, to cover the land in prayers, so that one day there would be freedom and justice for all. And so when this peninsula is reunified, and when the walls of tyranny crumble, it is not going to be because of a political uh, maneuvering that happened, it is because of the answers to the years of prayers that have been prayed for the fruitfulness of the kingdom of God to expand even in that nation. That is how the kingdom expands. It is through the prayers of his people who pray for fruitfulness as the word spreads forth. Amen? So that's important for us to pray for. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. Continuing on his prayer, he says, And so, as so to walk, he's saying, I'm praying for you for this way, so walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, and now underline this part in your outlines, bearing fruits in every good work. All right? So he's praying that they will bear fruits in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So Paul is praying for fruitfulness in their lives and in this church. 
bearing fruit in every good works. You see, there is a fruitfulness in ministry we must pray for, but also there is a fruitfulness in our own personal lives that we must pray for. So we want fruitfulness in ministries, yes. We want people to be saved, yes. We want people to grow in their faith, yes. But also he is revealing it is important to pray for fruitfulness in our personal lives as well, for personal fruitfulness. How does this personal fruitfulness happen? Jesus reveals very clearly in John 15, verse 4 and 5, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so he makes it very clear that personal fruitfulness is directly connected to our intimacy with the Lord. So it is important to strive not only for fruit in ministry, but to bear the fruit of the Spirit within our lives. Why? So that when we meet people, when the fruit of the Spirit is abundance, where there is much fruit of the Spirit in our lives, where there is deep love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control, when we are bearing the fruit of the Spirit and we meet other people, they will be able to taste of the Spirit, taste of the Lord, and to know that He is good. Because God is alive in you. And that's what we want to see happen through the church. Amen? May people, as they encounter you, taste and see that the Lord is good because he lives in you. So pray for fruitfulness for your pastors. Deep intimacy with the Lord that will result in an abundance of the fruit of the Spirit manifesting in their lives. And pray for great fruitfulness in our ministries as well, so that salvation would be commonplace and believers would grow deeper in maturity and deeper in love with Jesus. So pray for a great harvest of righteousness for the kingdom of God to expand within our midst. And there's a third important element that we need to pray for when we pray for effectiveness in ministry, and that is we pray for faithfulness. So everyone repeat, we pray for faithfulness. So we need to pray for wisdom and discernment when we will make the right choices. We need to pray for fruitfulness, that people would respond positively to the word that is declared. And also, we need to pray for faithfulness. So pray for ministers of the gospel to be faithful to the holy task of declaring his word. Pray that we will be faithful to the truth. That is getting harder in this day and age. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best. Paul is instructing his younger brother in the gospel, Timothy, his comrade that he is mentoring. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be shamed, a worker of the gospel who rightly handles the word of truth. Pray that pastors will be faithful with how we handle the word of God. That we will not preach our own messages, but only what God has spoken through his word. Pray that we will never water down the gospel. Pray that we will never compromise the gospel, but that we would declare the truth of the gospel, no matter how unpopular it is, that we would be unashamed to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? This prayer for faithfulness and conviction to the truth is utterly crucial to pray for your pastors in this generation, more than in generations past. So pray that for your pastors, obviously in Korea, in OEM, but also if you have family members or loved ones in your previous churches, your previous pastors in the United States and Canada and throughout the UK, especially where it is getting harder and harder for ministers of the gospel to publicly declare truth in this day and age. As I mentioned, four major denominations within the past two weeks in the United States have changed their definition of marriage to no longer be between a man and a woman 
they have changed it to be defined as between two people to accommodate the movement that we see happening for gay marriages. But you need to understand this. God created marriage. And in God's book of Genesis, it is not just the beginnings of how he created Adam and Eve. Their union was the first marriage in existence. And we see that God ordained for a man and a woman to come together before God and his people in marriage, in the holy covenants of marriage. And it is getting to the place now where you will be ridiculed, criticized, and there will come a day where you will even probably even go to jail for publicly declaring the truth of what the biblical definition of marriage is. And therefore, we need to pray for our pastors to be faithful to the truth no matter how unpopular it is. Amen? This generation of pastors need these prayers. Look at Paul's prayer also in Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word. So he is praying for more opportunities to deliver the word, to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. And look at verse 4. That I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. In praying for effectiveness in ministry and faithfulness in the word, Paul also prays to be able to declare the word clearly. May we do our best with the skills and abilities that God has given to us to present truth as clearly and effectively as possible. And in the midst of it, in the midst of even the opposition, pray not only that we'll be faithful to the truth, pray that we'll be faithful to God until the very end. Colossians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. May you be strengthened with all what? Power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance. Everyone say endurance. And patience with joy. Now that's a very strange combination of words. So he says, may you be strengthened with all power, and we'll say amen, right? Yeah, give me power, give me strength from God. Yes, according to his glorious might, amen. Yes, give me glorious power, glorious might. And then he says, for all endurance. Okay, I'm okay with endurance, God, give me endurance. And patience. Oh, okay, patience. Okay, I can do some patience. Give me patience with joy. Yes, give me joy. The reason why this is a strange combination of words is because we like the power, we like the joy, but you need to understand what he's really revealing. Because when do we need endurance and patience? When life is hard. You don't need endurance when you're at the theme park or at the beach playing with your friends. Oh, another day at the beach, hanging out with my friends. Oh, when will this day end? Oh, you don't need endurance and patience, right? When you're enjoying life, it flies by. You need endurance and patience with joy when life is hard. And what he is revealing in asking for prayer for this. He's like, I'm praying for power, joy, strength, and endurance and patience. Because life is going to be filled with suffering, difficulty, disappointments, persecution, and pain. And that's when you need God's power to be able to endure. Not just endure, like, when is this over? God, just kill me now. No, he says to endure with joy. That only comes from God. And that 
is what we need to be in prayer for, for each other, for our pastors. Because pastors, they're tempted to quit, give up the fights, get out of the race, if not weekly on Mondays, even daily. So pray that we will be faithful till the very end. Faithfulness is what we want in the very end. In the parable of the talents that Jesus talks about in Matthew 25, that the master comes and gives one five talents and then three and then uh, one and then these, they come back. The master returns from a long time and to the first one he gave five. The servant says, hey master, I invested what you gave me. Here's five more. And what does the master reply? Well done, good and faithful servants. And then look at what he says in verse 21. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over how much? A little. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much in glory. Enter now into the joy of your master. These are the precious words that we long to hear when we cross our finish line. But I love that his focus here was on faithfulness and faithfulness in small things. Because success in the eyes of God is very different from success in the eyes of the world. It is the world that looks at numbers. It is the world that looks at popularity. It is the world that looks at exterior things and measures these things and say, all right, now you are a success. But that's not how it is in the eyes of God. The one to whom God has called for you to be faithful in raising up that child when you are alone at home to sacrificially lose sleep in feeding, in changing, in comforting, that faithfulness in the little that God has called you to do, that will be greatly rewarded on eternal judgment day. Amen? That even though your sphere of influence is not like a Billy Graham, that doesn't matter. Just like when Peter says, hey, when Jesus predicts the way that Peter will die, he says, hey, what about John, your beloved man? You love him. Hey, Jesus said, hey, don't worry about him. You do what you got to do. You run the race that I've called you to race. You be faithful to what I have asked you to do. Don't compare yourself. Don't be envious of how God has called that person. You be faithful with what God has called you to do. Amen. Amen. That is success in the eyes of God. Because there will be a day when the applause of men and women will be no more. And you will stand before a holy God who made you. And the only applause that matters on that day is his applause. Well done, good, faithful servants. You've been faithful over little. Come and enter your master's happiness. You see, this is a very important thing to understand in light of what we just talked about in the second point, in praying for fruitfulness. The reason why is because, especially for ministers, because while we do want fruitfulness in ministry, we may not always get it. Many missionaries die without seeing the fruit of their labor of love. Many pioneers, missionaries do the hard work of plowing the hard soil, praying, weeping, loving, only to see little or no fruits. The early missionary work in Korea simply ended with locals killing these foreign missionaries because they've never seen a white person before. Even in Japan, which is right now nicknamed within missionary circles as the graveyard of missions work, because of how hard it is to see fruits. There are so many pastors and missionaries who labored for decades without seeing people come to Christ in Japan. 
Does that mean that their work was a failure? In the eyes of the world, yes. In the eyes of God, no. Because more than fruitfulness, God calls us to faithfulness. The words Jesus will speak to his successful servants at the end of Judgment Day is connected with faithfulness to what God has called us to do. You know, I've shared with some of you, some of you before how one person who inspired my faith growing up so much was Billy Graham. I loved him. I still do. I admired him. I loved looking at his picture because when I saw his face, I saw a reflection of lifelong faithfulness. And yes, it's true. I carried a picture of Billy Graham in my wallet when I was in junior high. While all my other friends had pictures of their girlfriends in their wallets, I had a picture of Billy Graham. Yes, I'm not ashamed to confess that uh, because I didn't have a girlfriend. So, Because when I saw him, I wasn't ashamed of the gospel. And so I wanted to look at him when I was at school and there was pressure to not talk about Jesus. And so I would look at his picture. and I want to be courageous with the gospel like he was. Because when I saw him, I saw a man greatly used by God and that's how I wanted to be used. When I saw him, I saw a man who was faithful to the very end of his race and I wanted to run my race like that too. I wanted to live for Jesus just a little bit more whenever I would look at him. And so even these days, uh, I have in my computer uh, a folder called Inspiration. And there I have people, pictures like Billy Graham, John Piper, Jed Packer, Bruce Walkey. People who, except for Piper, they're all in their 90s. A lot of them were my seminary professors, and some of them, they're retired but still teaching and writing. And when I see that, I was like, man, I would love to be 95 and still be faithful to the Lord. You know, one story that I've been so blessed by recently was the life of Jim Elliott's brother, Bert. Uh, we, many people know Jim Elliott. Uh, he, there's few people more well-known in modern-day missions than the martyr of Jim Elliott, whose books, journals, and quotes still inspire people around the world towards global missions. Uh, he's the one whose journal entry many years ago, his wife, Elizabeth Elliott, published and inspired so many people when he wrote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he can never lose. And uh, he was a light that burned brightly, though for a short time. He died while bringing the gospel to an unreached people group in Ecuador. And uh, that's usually the historic, uh, heroic image we think of when we think of missions. Go all out, you die, you become famous, and your life influences millions around the world. But then there's Jim Elliott's older brother, not younger brother, older brother, Bert. He too was a missionary, uh, but definitely not as well known. And he died a quiet death two years ago. Uh, Bert was a missionary in Peru even well before his younger brother, Jim, attempted to go to Ecuador. Bert and his wife spent over 60 years on the mission field in Peru since 1949 well into their 80s before their death. One time in an interview about his famous brother, Jim, Bert said this, Jim and I both served Christ, but I realize we're both very different. Jim was a mighty meteor streaking through the sky, but he never described himself. And so another pastor did. He said this, though Jim was a shooting star that inspired everyone who saw the brilliance of his lights, Bert's, was like a faint star in the night sky that would show up faithfully night after night, year after year, decade after decade, doing his part of shining in darkness to pave light for those who did not know Jesus. One author put it like this, in missions work, suffering sometimes results in a short life culminating in martyrdom, sometimes in a long life of daily dying to self and living for Christ. I believe Jim Elliott's reward is considerable for his martyrdom, but I wouldn't be surprised to discover that Bert's 
and his wife's rewards will be even far greater still. Multitudes that sleep in the dust of the earth will awake in glory. Some will awake to everlasting life. Others will awake to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise, as Daniel 12 tells us, will shine like the brightness of the stars in heaven and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Once again, there is wisdom. Those who are wise will use their life to bring others to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Elizabeth Elliot's uh, later husband said this after uh, visiting Bert's and his wife in uh, Peru. He wrote this, they, this couple, um, they were available for anyone who called them or rang their doorbell, whether they expected company or not. Along with open doors, uh, there were the Bible studies that they led, their involvement in Christian schools, plus a phenomenal drug rehab program leading addicts into a new life based on scripture. All this after 60 years on the field with no thought of a rocking chair or heading into retirements. This was a life of service to the Lord. Uh, he goes on to write, On our last day visiting Burt's, he said that if he had been given a paper and pencil and told to draw, draw out the perfect wish plan for his life, he would have never been able to draw up even something half as good as what the Lord eventually brought out throughout his life. And then he quoted from Psalm 16 that the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Bert's and his wife have lived a long obedience in the same direction. Whether we follow God to leave our country or to stay in our home country, all of us likewise are called to a life of faithful endurance as we follow Christ. So let us pray for our pastors to be effective and successful in the eyes of God for ministry. Pray that we would have great wisdom to make godly, God-honoring choices. That there would be great fruitfulness, but even more than that, that there would be lifelong faithfulness in little things and in big things until the very end so that you and I, when we breathe our last and enter glory, would have the honor of hearing the precious words, well done, good, faithful servants. You have been faithful with little. I'm going to entrust you with much in glory. Come and enter and share in the joy of your master. Music